Example 137. A study was done to determine the effects of a six-day administration of growth hormone on strength gains in men who performed the bench press. Two groups of men were randomly selected for the study. 25 of them were placed into the placebo control group. 23 of the men were given a six-day dose of growth hormone. On day one of the study, strength in the maximum bench press was recorded for each subject, and it was shown that the two groups were not significantly different from each other at that point in the study. Seven days after the last of the growth hormone injections were administered, strength in the maximum bench press was recorded again. The control group had an average max bench of 220 pounds and a standard deviation of 24 pounds. The growth hormone group had an average max bench of 251 pounds with a standard deviation of 18 pounds. Construct a 98% confidence interval estimate of the difference between the mean max bench presses for the two groups. Assume maximum bench press is a normally distributed random variable and do not assume equal variances. So look at that, do not assume equal variances. Does there appear to be a significant difference between the strength of the two groups? Okay, so let's start with the first thing we always look at, which is what we're supposed to do. There should be a phrase in the problem that indicates that, and it says construct a 98% confidence interval for the difference between the mean max bench presses for the two groups. So it's clearly a confidence interval, and it's gonna be for the difference between two groups. So we're gonna subtract those means, and that's how we're gonna construct our interval. From there, I wanna know if it's a small sample size or a large sample size problem. I look here, I see that there are 25 in the first group, 23 in the second group. That makes it a small sample size problem. And then finally, I need this bit of information here. It says, do not assume equal variances. So that's actually a pain when they say that. When they assume, that, when they tell us not to assume equal variances, that means that we're going to use this welch sather weight approximation method, which is the most difficult way to tackle the problem, but it is a way that's um, you know a little more formal and correct. There are some other methods that people use that are sort of um, conservative uh, estimates of that, and you know we won't use that here. But of course, if your teacher allows you to do that, that's great because then you don't have to um, work out this complicated formula we're about to look at. All right, so let's start looking at the steps to do this problem. The first thing we should do, of course, is copy down the data. Let's go ahead and get that nice and organized. We're going to have the control group, and then we'll have the hormone group. So I'll just say growth hormone group. Okay, so for these two groups, the control group had an N. It says here, two groups of men were randomly selected for the study. 25 of them were placed into the control group. So the N for that is 25. We then see 23 group were given growth hormone, 23 people. So we'll say 23 for the growth hormone group. Then we go on down to find more information. The control group had an average of 220 pounds. So that was their average max bench, 220, with a standard deviation of 24. And for the growth hormone group, their max bench was 251, and standard deviation was 18. And remember, at the beginning of the study, there was no significant difference between their bench press maximums. And we have an alpha here of 2%, right? 0 0.02 because the confidence level is 98, so from 100, it gives us 2% left over. All right, now from there, we're going to do a couple of extra things in this step. We're going to just calculate some things that will be handy later on. So let's go ahead and do them now up front. Uh, to show you what we need to do in the long run, I'm going to cover up the problem here and show you that document in the notes beneath that gives the steps. And this is going to basically give you some idea of what needs to be done for the problem. So essentially, we're going to form the fam same four steps, you know, gather the data from the problem, find the critical value, get the margin of error, and then fill in the interval. But because of this need to get a complicated degrees of freedom for our critical value, um, it becomes a little more work. So we're just going to add a couple of things here. Let's go ahead and calculate the difference between the means. We're only going to do that just so we have it for later. So if you want to do that now, you can do it now, or you can do it later. Actually, let's just do that later. We'll do it down here. That's easy enough. But let's calculate this A and B quantity. So the A quantity is just the variance for the first group. So in other words, we're going to square that 24. And we're going to divide it by the sample size, which is 25 in this case. And for B, this is going to be for the second group, basically. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to take that 18 there for S, and we're going to square it. And then we're going to divide by its sample size, 23. Okay, so A and B are going to give us these values that we can use later on in the formula. So I'm just going to calculate those quickly. And I'm actually going to store them in my calculator so that I don't have to um, type them out every time I need them. So that's really helpful if you have a store feature in your calculator. 24 squared divided by 25. So when I hit enter, I get 23.04. I'm going to store that under A, alpha A in my calculator. You could, of course, just you know, uh, write it out here, especially for this one. It's nice and you know, 
short, it's not too bad to have to write that down and use it later. But if it's stored in your calculator, you just have an easier keystroke to get it in there. And then same thing here, we'll have 18 squared divided by 23. And when you do that, you get 14.08. So this one's a little longer. And again, now I'm more, um, you know, I feel that my store feature is going to be a lot more useful here because in that case, you know, I don't have to write all this out, right? So I'm just going to dot, dot, dot that, but I'll store it in my calculator so that I have it for later. And I put it in a variable called B. So now I have A and B in my calculator ready for use later on. Okay, so now I've done that. Our next step is going to be to go down to this part where we get the degrees of freedom. So you'll see that I had calculate this quantity and this quantity. You can do that in the first step. It'll help you when you come down here. These things will move along a little faster. But I'm just going to do them um, as we go. So I'm not going to do all that in the first step. So let's go on to step two. Step two is going to be to determine this critical value. And we need to find T alpha because we're dealing with a small sample size. Alpha divided by two is going to be 0 0.01 because you're dividing that alpha in half when we're doing a confidence interval with two sides, remember that. So it's T.01 and then the degrees of freedom is the issue. To get the degrees of freedom we're going to need a special formula. So let's go get those degrees of freedom now. So I'm just going to put DF here and let's go on to see what that degree of freedom will be. The formula is actually this complicated formula here, and there's a little asterisk here saying that how the formula turns out, if it turns out as a decimal number, you'll just drop the decimal part. So truncate to the nearest whole number, it's basically like rounding down in other words. So even if it's uh, 25.9, we just call it 25. Okay, so let's look at our, our work here. It'll be A plus B, so I'll have, in this case, you know, 23.04 plus the 14.086 dot dot dot. That'll be in the top with a square on it. Then I'll, in the denominator, have a squared, which is 23.04 squared, divided by n minus 1. So it's going to be 24 in our case, right? Because 25 minus 1, right? The n minus 1 here, n minus 1, 24. OK, and then we'll do the b squared. The b is going to be 14.086 dot dot dot. We're going to square that, then divide by, and again, it's the sample size minus 1, so 22 in this case. OK, so that's the formula that's going to give us our degrees of freedom. So it's quite complicated to do that. Now, I luckily have these things in my calculator already. So this is my A and B, and so I can just use that in my calculator a little nicer and it won't have any rounding either. So alpha A plus alpha B, close parenthesis, square. Then I'm going to divide that uh, numerator by, and I'm going to use parenthesis here for the bottom, and then I'm just going to put alpha A squared, right, divided by 24 plus alpha b squared divided by 22. I'll close that up now, closing up the bottom uh, you know, denominator all in one parenthesis. Then I hit enter and I get my answer. So it's 44.26, etc. So we're going to go ahead and round that, right? or not round it, but truncate it rather. So 44.2 dot dot dot, we're just going to call it 44. So remember, truncate means to just rip off the decimal part and ignore it, or you could think of it as rounding down. That would be the same thing. Okay, so 44 is our answer for the degrees of freedom. So now we can go to our table, look in the 0.01 column with 44 degrees of freedom, and that will give us our critical value for our confidence interval. Let's go do that now. So we're looking at the 0.01 column and 44 degrees of freedom. So let's move the table down so we can see that. When we do that, we see over here in the second column here that there's a 40 and there's a 45. There's no 44 degrees of freedom. So between the two values, even though 44 is closer to the 45, I'm going to choose the value that's in the 40 row. And I'm going to choose that because it's a little larger than the 45 value. This is going to make our result a little bit conservative, but I would rather do that than to have it be too small. So I'm going to take the number that's a little bit too large. So we're going to use 2.423 in this case. Okay, so the conservative value that we come up with, and again, we're being, using a conservative value here because our table doesn't exactly have 44 degrees of freedom. So doing that, we end up with the answer 2.423. Okay, so there is our critical value. Now at that point, we're going to take that number and we're going to plug it into our margin of error formula. And the rest is pretty straightforward, pretty much like what we've done before. So there's not so much new here now. So let's go on and finish this up then. 
The margin of error formula looks very similar to the ones we've used in the past in this section. We're going to have the t alpha divided by 2 value that we just found. Then we're going to have a square root. And that square root is going to have the variance for the first group over the sample size plus the variance for the second group over the sample size. So we don't have a pooled estimator any longer because we're not assuming equal variances, right? So we just plug in the variances we were given in the problem. So 2.423 then the square root of, and we plug in the numbers here. So if you look at this, actually, this is just your A, isn't it really? Because if you think about it, what was A? It was S squared, right? Which is what we have to do, S1 squared divided by its sample size, 25. So this is really like your A plus B. You could write it that way as well. And since we've already done that, I'm just gonna go ahead and plug that in that way um, in my calculator. So I'll write it out here, but in my calculator, I'm gonna actually just do what we said before, right? So we're going to actually do a plus b under the square root and it'll make this calculation a lot faster. Okay, but either way, again, so it's the standard deviation squared divided by its sample size for the first one, the standard deviation squared for the second group, so 18 squared divided by its sample size, 23. Okay, now let's go ahead and plug that all in. So we've got 2.423 times the square root of, and again, because I've stored the A and the B in my calculator, I can do this very quickly. Close it up, hit enter. So 2.423 times the square root of A plus B, and end up with 14.766 enter, right? So 14.76 dot dot dot. I'm gonna store that in my calculator for use later. So there it is, it's ready to go. And my next step is the final step of the process. This is where I do the interval. So I have x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus the error, comma, same thing on the other side, right? x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus the error. All right, so let's go ahead and do that quickly. So if we take the uh, difference between these two, we're going to subtract them in that order. So control minus growth hormone, right? We're going to see that the difference is negative 31, correct? Right? If you did that in your calculator, 220 minus 251, you get negative 31. Okay, so that difference is negative 31. Then minus the error. The error was approximately 14.76 something, right? So 14.76 dot dot dot, and then negative. 31 plus 14.76 dot dot dot. Okay, so let's see what that ends up giving us in the end. So we'll take that minus 31, we'll subtract off the error, and then we'll do the same thing, but we'll add the error this time. And so we end up with negative 45 point, let's say eight, and then minus 16.2. All right, so in the end, our answer is from negative 45.8 to negative 16.2. And what are we saying here? We're saying that we are 98% confident. We are 98% confident that the true difference, in other words, mean for control minus the mean for the growth hormone group is between and the numbers are between minus 45.8 pounds, right? And negative 16.2 pounds. And if we think that that is correct, and we do based on our calculations, right? Then what we're going to say is very simply that it seems that the growth hormone has an effect, right? So in the problem before, they asked us the last part of that problem, if we look back at our, our problem itself, remember that it says, does there appear to be a significant difference between the strength of the two groups? And it does seem that that's the case because the interval is entirely negative. Remember, if it's all negative or all positive, it means that the significant difference between the two means exists. And then because it's all negative here, it means the second mean in our subtraction, the one that went second, was larger than the first. So what this means is that the average uh, maximum bench press for people on growth hormone in this study was higher than it was for the people in the control group. Remember, there was no difference at the beginning of the study, so the fact that there's a difference at the end of it implies that the growth hormone has an effect on strength. And so this uh, is more evidence, again, that growth hormone um, can make a difference in athletic performance. And so in the Olympics, for example, the substance perhaps should be banned.